let me very quickly go through the agenda uh, for this for this uh, dialogue. Uh, it will commence with uh, two keynote uh, panelists that will set the scene based on the extensive research and development work in achieving resilience and sustainable food systems. This will be followed by a panel of uh, experts and researchers from government, Pan-African regional organizations, international development partners, and the private sector. Participants are welcome to comment and raise questions uh, in the question and answer box. Uh, let me proceed by highlighting the objectives of this uh, panel uh, presentation and open forum, uh, which is a side event to the UN Food System Summit Science Days. Leaders across the private and public research and development sectors will identify and discuss the key actions needed to advance adaptive agriculture research and to develop an enabling policy environment to support the steady stream of uh, technological innovations necessary for resilience and sustainable food systems. The discussions will review evidence of evolving economic transformation and progress towards a resilience in Sub-Saharan Africa from the Board for International Food and Agriculture Development uh, commissioned Agriculture Productivity, Growth and Resilience and Economic Transformation Sub-Saharan Africa Report and the World Bank publication uh, on Harvesting Prosperity, Technology and Productivity Growth in Agriculture. Together, panelists and participants will identify lessons learned from countries in which substantial investments in adaptive agriculture research and development and extension systems have shown the catalytic role of productivity-led agricultural growth in contributing to employment, resilience, and economic transformation. Uh, this dialogue, uh, in our view, uh, I'm speaking again as somebody who has worked uh, in this space uh, in the agriculture sector for uh, decades. Um, I think it presents a coalition of the willing uh, from the global north as well as uh, from the global south in addressing the challenges uh, associated with building resilience and sustainable food systems. Uh, it is our hope, I'm speaking again on behalf of uh, the hundreds of uh, African uh, experts, uh, it is our hope that uh, this coalition of partners will be sustainable beyond the UN Food Systems uh, Summit. And I trust, again, that our colleagues I mean, who are in the audience uh, will be able to uh, reflect uh, deeply on how best we sustain these conversations within Africa to ensure that our, uh, our governments uh, begin to really uh, respond to the challenges that confront the agriculture sector, particularly in terms of reaching out better to smallholder farmers. And again, you know, it is our view that, uh, you know, governments will need to be at the center stage uh, in responding to the calls that have been made for many, many years. And yet uh, we see rather limited action in as much as uh, all of us are seeing that uh, there is uh, a hope for a renewal of the agriculture sector in Africa. But uh, we believe very truly that more can be done uh, to enhance agriculture productivity by commitments by African governments with more resources uh, into the agriculture sector. More critically, from our view, again, I'm speaking uh, on behalf of many, many African organizations, uh, we feel that uh, this is uh, the right time to begin to bring on board the civil society organizations who are also very critical to addressing the challenges of uh, building the necessary resilience and sustainable agriculture productivity uh, among especially smallholder farmers. And indeed, as we will be hearing from uh, some of the presenters, we're particularly keen that our smallholder farmers become central players to research and development uh, agendas that are, have been pursued and continue to be pursued in our countries. Um, they need to be involved uh, in research, uh, not just uh, as a, you know, a token, but uh, as really active uh, participants. Um, because uh, we, we believe uh, um, it is time that uh, 
you know, we realize that uh, the research we do needs to be uh, democratized as well as uh, the information that we send out to smallholder farmers needs to be democratized so that, uh, you know, these smallholder farmers are central to those uh, conversations. Once again, I would like to welcome uh, everybody and we look forward to a very uh, practical and very exciting conversation. Uh, allow me, I think, at this juncture to proceed to introduce our two key panelists that will set the scene uh, for this uh, uh, conversation, this dialogue. And these are uh, Professor Tom Jane. Uh, Tom Jane is uh, somebody uh, I have personally known for close to two decades. Uh, he is a great supporter of uh, strengthening African agriculture policy research institutes. He has been uh, a very prominent C uh, feature uh, in uh, a lot of uh, our uh, Pan-African um, uh, events, particularly those that speak to agriculture policy. And uh, he was one of the key authors of uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the document that uh, will be part of uh, uh, his presentation and uh, which will inform these uh, conversations. Uh, in addition, let me also proceed uh, to introduce uh, Madihar Gatam, who is a lead economist in agriculture global practice at the World Bank. His experience in agriculture and food policy cuts across the development world, including uh, his work in South Asia and Africa. Uh, he has uh, authored and contributed to numerous reports uh, including journals on uh, the subject of uh, agriculture productivity, growth research, extension, and rural finance, as well as rural poverty, among other of uh, his uh, uh, publications. Allow me, therefore, uh, to welcome first uh, Tom Jane uh, to give us uh, his uh, uh, remarks. Uh, he will have uh, five minutes of uh, uh, reflections based on uh, some of the work which uh, he has actually uh, undertaken in Africa, and more recently, uh, the report which uh, he presented to BFAD. Uh, Tom? Great. Thank you, Richard. And uh, to all of the participants, uh, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so uh, my job is to tee up a few questions uh, for the kind of to guide the uh, panel discussion. And let me start just by, you know, not that this needs a lot of uh, convincing of this crowd, but the relationship between agricultural productivity growth and poverty reduction is, is quite well established. You can see in this graph here, the vertical axis measures uh, productivity growth in agriculture. And as you can see from uh, countries in that Northwest quadrant there, uh, the, the countries that are having higher levels of productivity growth are having uh, greater reductions in poverty uh, over time. So the evidence is quite compelling that productivity growth is, is super important. And as we think about, you know, in this year of, of food systems development, this is the kind of year of the UN food systems, uh, I think one of the important things for us to um, remember is the centrality of productivity growth in uh, leading to the development and the resilience of these uh, food systems throughout the world. So then the question becomes, how do we, how do we get that productivity growth uh, to happen? And uh, maybe in, there's two broad categories of underlying drivers of productivity. The first one is the enabling environment, things like um, good policies that support private investment and in food systems. Uh, infrastructure, uh, roads, electricity, power, and so forth. And the other one is agricultural R&D that actually leads to technical innovation on the farm. Uh, so what, what do we mean by technical innovation? Um, examples of these are higher yielding seed varieties uh, that um, are more fertilizer responsive, uh, higher levels of fertilizer, both organic fertilizer, as well as inorganic fertilizer, improved management practices that improve soil fertility, uh, help soil retain more moisture, uh, good agronomy, basically. Uh, and then, you know, bi-directional learning uh, through well-functioning extension systems where 
scientists are able to learn from farmers and farmers are able to learn from scientists in this kind of bi-directional learning system. Uh, there's a lot of research that's established that these are the building blocks of farm productivity growth. Uh, so um, three issues that I'd like to tee up here before uh, I yield. The first one is that we all know that there's an international research system, uh, the CG uh, is part of that. Uh, and then there's these national level research systems in uh, countries. And are these, is the international and the national, are they synced up and working well together? Are they synergistic? Or are there constraints um, at, at either level that are impeding the effectiveness of the whole system in getting improved technology uh, and practices to farmers. Uh, that's number one. The second issue is um, how to establish more political commitment for agricultural R and D and E. Uh, many of you probably know that um, agricultural research constitutes, on average, about two or three percent of African governments' uh, budgets to agriculture, very, very tiny portion of this, despite a lot of research that shows how uh, it can be among the most effective drivers of productivity growth. In Africa, uh, this comes from our BIFAD report that uh, I think you've had the link for, that even though Africa's had quite um, positive um, and, and high rates of production growth in agriculture, the lion's share of that's driven by area expansion and not very much by yield growth. Uh, and that really needs to change. Uh, we note that Asian governments spend on average about eight times more per farmer than uh, most African governments do. So no wonder that um, productivity and yield growth in Asia um, is racing forward, whereas in Africa, um, it's not growing very quickly. So there's uh, generally these long uh, gestation periods, as Carl Eicher used to put it, between the time when you actually spend money on agricultural research and when you get the payoffs. So even though the payoffs are quite large, uh, there is sort of a time lag between this. Okay, the last point I wanna make uh, is uh, this issue about, um, uh, you know, technical innovation should occur in ways that are both accessible to farmers and also promote a sustainability and resilience. And some questions have arisen, uh, whether there is a potential conflict between different kinds of science. Uh, is modern agricultural R&D uh, compatible with and, and merging and incorporating traditional and indigenous kinds of knowledge and science? Uh, is there a conflict between modern science and sustainability agroecological principles? Uh, or you know, are, are these working together synergistically in a, in a positive way? Uh, is one type of science crowding out the other type of science? Uh, these are issues that um, uh, I think our panelists will be well served to, to comment on uh, as we go forward. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to uh, hand over to my colleague Madhur Gautam to continue his opening remarks. Madhur. Thank you, Tom. Um, and thank you, Richard, for the introduction. Um, what I'd like to do today is uh, step back from the, 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 the very relevant African perspective that Tom's provided to sort of summarize some of the key lessons and messages coming out of uh, our global analysis, looking at uh, agriculture productivity and the performance of agriculture productivity growth um, in, in, uh, across the world. And I'll, I'll focus uh, very briefly on, on just uh, four, four key questions and they are, and they'll show up at the top. I don't wanna take time to go through uh, an outline of the presentation at this time. So first of all, the question is, what is at stake? Agriculture productivity, as Tom mentioned, is at the core of, of agricultural growth. It is key to food nutrition security, uh, is uh, key to agricultural growth uh, overall, to poverty reduction, to equity, resilience, and to environmental sustainability. We know uh, quite well the statistics on, on poverty uh, and the importance of agriculture productivity growth. The figure on the right uh, uh, shows uh, what Tom has alluded to, 
that agriculture is not just uh, important for uh, poverty reduction, but it's more, you know, in, if, uh, for the equivalent growth, agriculture delivers more poverty reduction than growth in other sectors. And this is inversely related with GDP per capita, meaning that it's even more effective in poorer countries than it is on, in, in the, the well-off countries. Uh, second, uh, food security, you know, um, as, as we know, uh, the, as we are off track of SDG2, global uh, hunger is rising and it uh, puts the onus back onto uh, looking for solutions to increase production from limited resources. And as um, and, and the other um, issue is on malnutrition, not only under nutrition, which remains significant across parts of the world, but obesity is rising. A bigger challenge that I'll allude to again in the next uh, slide is climate change. Um, and it will hit um, agriculture the hardest and where the largest number of poor live. Um, all of this uh, amounts to showing that agriculture productivity growth um, is central to the to, to transformation agenda that is impeded by the slow convergence with other sectors. So when you're looking at uh, what drives agricultural growth, um, increasingly evidence shows um, that it is driven by productivity, which is uh, typically referred to by economists as total factor productivity where you're getting more from the same or less a level of resources. This is highly uneven across countries. But a bigger challenge that comes to light now is, as we have suspected, new research is confirming that climate change is already having a huge impact on agriculture productivity growth. Globally, it has already since 1961 reduced um, uh, the potential growth by 21% and impacts are much more severely felt in some of the poorer countries, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the Caribbean, uh, uh, Central America, and parts of East Asia. And, and this is something to worry about as it seems like over 40% um, is almost being uh, wiped out uh, as a result of climate change, uh, which means that we have to, to uh, uh, ex increase our investments in agriculture productivity, pay even more attention uh, to agriculture productivity growth. So what impedes agriculture productivity growth? And this is where uh, we identify two paradoxes, the two innovation paradoxes. One is that we know that agricultural returns uh, are high, as Tom mentioned, yet uh, what we see is overall um, investments in agriculture production at the global level seem to be falling. The data, the most reliable data we have is on 54 countries from the OECD database, and it shows that agriculture uh, uh, investments in agriculture productivity and agriculture research and development peaked in about 2014 and since then have followed. Uh, the sim a similar pattern is also visible uh, uh, in the CGIR funding, international funding, international research funding, which seems to have peaked around 2015-16 at about $1 billion and currently has now, it now stands at about 830. Clearly, much more needs to be done, especially since we know there are long time lags and the effects of this will be felt for a very long time. The second paradox is if the farmers know how you know, the, the returns are so high, why don't they invest? And, and this is particularly true with the low levels of adoption in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. The report goes through a number of uh, reasons and, and factors that might be behind some of this. And these are sort of summarized in the next slides. What do we need to do to, to change the uh, uh, patterns? Uh, uh, sorry, this, I'm just trying to pull up all of the things so I can kind of walk through them. Um, action is needed on both sides of the, of the innovation equation, the supply side, as well as the uh, demand side. On the supply side, a, a, focus needs, a major focus needs to be on strengthening public sector institutions. Not only uh, do we need much more funding than is available, but then we need a whole uh, institutional ecosystem to, um, uh, to ensure that we deliver results um, and, and the priorities are, are uh, aligned with user needs and the user demands. The second is uh, private sector will not be able to do it alone. How do we mobilize the, the private sector and what needs to be done uh, in, in partnership with the private sector to be, get the biggest uh, uh, impact on agriculture productivity growth? On the demand side, uh, uh, Tom already referred to the enabling environment. And here um, I might add some of the research that we are doing now shows that it's not for lack of funding. Agriculture is well supported across the world. There are about $700 billion being supported uh, through agriculture policies um, and, and, and uh, support programs uh, uh, for agriculture. And the question is, can these be repurposed to deliver the, a better food system and, and a food system transformation that we all would like to see? 
And here, uh, some important issues uh, remain in terms of how public expenditures are used and how the policies are aligned uh, to, to deliver the triple wins that we'd like to see on productivity, environmental sustainability, and nutrition. And last but not the least is human capital and capabilities, closing the education gaps, but also supporting the farmers um, in improving the managerial uh, skills on farm and along the value chains. Uh, it, it remains an outstanding agenda. Uh, and this refers uh, in large part to the extension of advisory services that were referred to by Tom, but also um, other marketing negotiation skills and support to the, the small medium scale that currently uh, uh, constitutes much of the value change. And with that, um, I'd like to stop and hand it back to Richard. Well, th thank you, Madhul. Uh, thank you, Tom. I think both of you are raising extremely important issues uh, around uh, you know, how agriculture productivity uh, can be enhanced uh, in Africa as well as uh, globally. Uh, Madhu, you're providing us with a global perspective, whilst uh, Tom has actually raised also some very important questions, which are, I think are related to this uh, conversation uh, around uh, political commitment. And indeed, I think Madhu, uh, you're also saying that uh, we need also to pay attention to uh, commitments from the private sector uh, to working better with uh, smallholder farmers and uh, the role of our CG centers uh, in uh, that process uh, is one which is actually co continuously recurring and is an issue that uh, we need to address in terms of how it works very closely with uh, local research and development uh, systems as well as uh, uh, extension. Uh, so these are important uh, issues that are, are being raised and I believe uh, we shall have the opportunity of hearing a little more from uh, 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 you know, uh, panel, uh, panelists who are going to make uh, uh, additional remarks. Uh, so the next uh, discussion is uh, from uh, uh, these uh, panelists uh, who will actually uh, respond probably to some of the issues which are uh, both of you, Tom, as well as uh, um, Madhu, you have actually raised. Uh, so the panel discussion that will follow up, therefore, will focus on the priority actions for investments in research and development for productivity-led growth, which uh, you have uh, very eloquently uh, addressed, both of you. I would like to hear uh, from leaders uh, from government and pan-African organizations, as well as uh, international uh, partners. Uh, I would like, in this regard, to uh, begin uh, uh, to, to, to uh, you know, call upon uh, the, the colleagues um, who will be on this panel, who will make uh, uh, very uh, brief remarks, uh, each one of the panelists will make very brief remarks, uh, and uh, these uh, panelists include uh, uh, Kevin Orama, the Senior Director, African Development uh, Institute of the African Development Bank, and uh, Lulama Dibongo Trabu, the Technical Director of the Regional Network of Agriculture Policy Research Institutes, as well as uh, Robert uh, Bretham, the Chief Scientist, Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, USID. Uh, so let me uh, call upon first uh, Kevin O'Rama uh, to uh, respond and uh, give some interventions uh, based on uh, both um, uh, the, 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 the presentations, but also from your own uh, perspective uh, as somebody who works with uh, this uh, regional bank, but also as a, a, a renowned economist uh, from Africa. Uh, Kevin? Thank you uh, very much, Richard, and thank you colleagues and uh, participants. Uh, I think uh, th this topic is really very uh, crucial at this moment, especially after COVID-19, when we're seeing a lot of uh, food insecurity increasing, uh, what I would call the food pandemic. My responses will actually emerge from a global community of practice that we had at the African Development Bank uh, back in April 2020, looking at that question of building resilience in food systems and agricultural value chains in Africa after COVID-19. And uh, a number of the issues that came up uh, from the policymakers and practitioners are very similar to the points that both Tom 
and our colleague from the World Bank have raised. One of them is about whose knowledge counts, whose evidence counts when we make policies uh, for increasing agricultural productivity, uh, defining what crops we focus on, and also uh, the policies about agricultural markets, import exports, and so on. So here, there's a, a big call for us to actually um, value a lot more uh, the knowledge of the indigenous peoples themselves, uh, communities and, and uh, African experts, uh, because they understand the system beyond the technical knowledge that we, we, we have. And uh, bringing both the technical and the indigenous knowledge uh, together will help us to be able to make policies that addresses the issues of the countries and of the people uh, in a more um, sustainable and resilient way. Then the other one is the issues around financing. Um, you know, the, uh, the second question that Tom had asked is, is in terms of the international and the national research, how they work together, which one is uh, overpowering the other, which one is being prioritized. I think the, the truth be told, uh, African governments need to invest more in um, research and development, agricultural science and technology and innovation, and also in supporting youths and women of, in Africa to engage in agriculture as a business. Um, because uh, there's this age old saying that he who, whoever pays the piper dictates the tunes. So the dominance of international research in agriculture and in everything in Africa drives from the fact that Africans and African governments and African private sector are not really investing heavily in these areas. The total in, uh, gross investment in research and development in Africa hovers around 0.42%, compared to above 2% in many other countries. So we need to up our game in that. And the policy framework is already there. We have the uh, Maputo Declaration uh, on Agriculture and Food Security, uh, where governments agree to allocate at least 10% of uh, national budgets to agriculture. And as Tom has told us, we're just doing 2 to 3%. So let's honor that um, uh, declaration, and that will help African knowledge, African research, indigenous knowledge, and indigenous practices to feature more in how we shape the agricultural research, knowledge, and technologies that come up. Uh, the other part of it is marketing. How do we structure our markets in a way that prioritizes or at least encourages local products? Uh, what we have in Africa now is that increasing productivity is some, some, somehow impaired by imports of food products. Africa spends over $135 billion annually to import food crops. And then these food crops that are imported are often cheaper in the market than the local products. So it just, just actually substitutes the local products. So we need to look at that um, in order to encourage uh, smallholder uh, farmers to be able to make gain in farming. Otherwise, they will not continue to invest in, in doing that. And uh, uh, around that includes the issues about building regional value chains. If you look at the tracks in terms of where the food Africans eat come from, is mostly from outside. And this is a continent that, own, that has about 60% of arable land in the world. So we actually should be exporting food instead of importing food at that huge bill that governments have to take. Investing in commodity exchanges and marketing boards uh, for major staple foods is also another area that came up very strongly that we need to try and uh, try to invest in and rebuilding intra-regional trade. Now we have the ACFTA, let's use it and make it work for Africa. If we're able to increase the trade by just 1%, we'll be generating over $70 billion uh, of incomes in Africa. Other areas that came up in the targeted investment, fiscal policies to encourage youths and women to um, invest in agriculture and stay in agriculture a lot more. These things will not happen by chance if there are no targeted policies that will help countries to do that. And the final word for me is diversification. We keep talking about diversification in Africa whenever we have uh, fiscal challenges and, and, and problems. But then the diversification goes away whenever we start having some, some form of commodity booms. Agriculture has proven to be the best sector actually in creating resilience, improving the, the, the price, um, uh, the CPIs in Africa and everywhere in the world. 
let's prioritize those and invest in those, and that will help Africa a lot. And with that, with those few remarks, I will pass on to my colleague, uh, Lulama, to continue with her remarks. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, good afternoon, evening or morning, depending upon the time zone from which you're joining us today. Um, as a representative of the Renapri Network, I want to say that we're very excited to be a part of such an important conversation on the role of R&D in achieving resilience and sustainability in the food systems. And so I would like to thank Richard and Tom and Madura for taking the leadership on this issue. So for my part today, I just want to make three interventions. And I believe my first intervention, Tom, will touch on your issue about mobilizing uh, political commitment to R&D. So the first point I want to make is on the current level of public spending on R&D. So in preparing for this meeting, like a good panelist, I went ahead and I actually did read through the BIFED and the World Bank report. And what struck me was table eight on page 67 of the BIFED report, where in this table we see that in terms of ag research intensity, Sub-Saharan African um, governments were spending um, on IR&D was equivalent to 0.38% of ag GDP. And coincidentally, earlier this week, I happened to read through the MAFAP report on public expenditure on food and agriculture in Sub-Saharan Africa. And for the 13 countries that they were tracking, they're showing similar underspending. So while on average 18% of national budgets were being spent on R&D, for all 13 countries in their study, they were spending less than 1% of ag GDP on R&D. On, on and so for me, this was worrying, right? And I wanted to understand, is this true for all sub-Saharan African countries? Because I know for all of us, right, we all do appreciate the reality that Africa is a continent and not a country. So I went digging and I went and I looked at IFPRI's ASTI data. And what I found is for the 40 countries that they're tracking in the, for the latest available year, only six countries were spending on ag R&D was greater than 1% of their ag GDP, right? And these countries were Botswana, Cabo Verde, Mauritius, Namibia, South Africa, and surprisingly Zimbabwe, right? And so for myself, I confirmed that the majority of the sub-Saharan African countries have failed to achieve the African Union's cartoon target of 1% of ag GDP spent on R&D. So for me, the bottom line was this, as a continent, we've set the target of 1% of ag GDP going towards R&D, but we haven't achieved it. So at some level, we have this political commitment. And so going forward, we need to get serious about achieving our targets. Right, and so, and to do this though, we're going to need to look at the issues at a country level. We need to understand or unpack what are the issues or the factors that are constraining our ability to achieve this target that we've set for ourselves. And so this then brings me to my second point or my second intervention, right? So at some level, if you look at the data, our governments were spending, okay, albeit small, we are spending on R and D, R and D, private sector as well. And so the question that I started to wonder was, well, where are we focusing our spending? Essentially, I wanted to get a sense of what were the technologies that we are developing as a continent. So what I did is I went ahead and I looked at patent publications by field of technology. And this is data that is compiled by the World Intellectual Property Organization or WIPO. Right? And what I did is I pulled data on the number of patent publications by Africans published in Africa, right? And disaggregated by field of technology. And I wanted to compare it across two decades. So my first decade was 2000 to 2009. The second decade was 2010 to 2019. And what I noted was that I saw something interesting in the data. For fields of technologies that were great, have greater application to the primary ag level um, of the, the value chain, right? The number of patents published increased between the two decades. So for example, uh, patents in biotechnology. In 2000 to 2009, the number of patents published by Africans in Africa were 133. In the second decade, 2010 to 2019, that number went up to 200 patents published. For environmental technology, 
right? First decade, 197 patents were published. In the second decade, that number increased slightly to 212. So that's a, that's a positive sign, right? But when we looked at fields of technologies with greater application in the downstream levels of the food system, the number of patents published declined between the two decades, right? So for example, patents within food chemistry, first decade, 216 patents published. Second decade, that number fell to 190. For handling technology, so this is technology for cranes, packaging, et cetera, right? That number went from the first decade, 650 patents, into the second decade, 264. So it fell by more than half. For textile, food, and paper machines, again, we see that patents, um, that decline happening. First decade, on 94 patents published. Second decade, that number fell to 75. So one could argue this fall in the number of patents published in fields of technology with greater application in the downstream levels reflects the return to investment to the private sector. And if this is the case, then we can make the argument for the need for public R&D in these areas of technology. So R&D needs to go beyond the farm gate. And so for me, the bottom line is yes, R&D focused on primary agriculture is critical. And I think Tom and Madur really covered that nicely in their presentation. But if we want to ensure resilience and sustainability for the entire food system, we need to also invest in technologies that are relevant to the downstream levels of the food system. And so now this brings me to my third and final part. And that is to say that we need to focus on R&D that goes beyond just the hard sciences. And so focused on their social sciences as well. So those are my three points and now I'll turn it over to Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Lulama and greetings everyone. <clears throat> I think Tom and Madhur uh, laid out very clearly the what uh, in their presentations. And then I think Tom's issues that he raised and challenged us all with are part, really about the how and the Lama's responded to some of those and I'm going to try to do the same drawing on some of our understanding of the ag transformation that has underpinned what uh, Madhur so eloquently described. Um, so on CGIR NARS balance, I think the key there to start with is to look at what it is we're trying to do and make sure it's fit for purpose. So for example, if we think about plant breeding, we know that we need data at scale that reflects uh, uh, data from farmers' fields. The only efficient way to do that is to partner with NARS. And there's many other aspects of that too. So I think what we're seeing now in the CGIR and the one CGIR is a more integrated approach that really takes into account the uh, capacities of, of national partners. And this same is true for production systems research and farming systems uh, and things like soil fertility. You just have to deal with, uh, you have to have farmers involved, you have to have local partners involved, and you mix what is ever coming from your global international public goods type research with the situational farmer knowledge informed, uh, participant uh, informed uh, 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 on, the, on the ground to get the right uh, product, if you want to call it that, that can, is ready for adoption. I would also mention policy research in this regard, because if without national partners absolutely integrated in that, political economy and other key understandings of local context will be lost and not really uh, addressed. And I think that'll, the quality and the impact of the research will suffer. So these Questions beg, Tom's questions beg the question, is the balance right? I think it probably isn't exactly that we probably need to think of ways to have more engagement of national, uh, of, of NARS and many NARS have really become stronger and they're ready to, to, to take on a role that adds to the generation of regional and global uh, public goods. If I could wave a wand, I would probably love to see that some of our bilateral funding and USAID missions be linked to research. Where that's happened in terms of building national collaboration, it's really made an impact in terms of uh, development projects on the ground. So uh, we need to just keep working on that based on the outcomes and the, and the influence that we can get. But we need, so we need to engineer around that funding stream uh, dysfunctionality or disconnect is a better word, I think. Um, overall lack of national investment, that was Tom's second message. 
I think what we saw here is the glass is definitely half full. Uh, some countries are doing much better, and Lulama uh, also shared some uh, observations on this. So I think the incentive is there for decision makers to think about how to uh, invest more in this area. And I'd like to flag here that nothing drives donor interest and co-investment like our partner countries showing their own national commitment and leadership and ownership. And then with respect to access and sustainability, your third issue, Tom, I think the thing I'd like to do is interpret sustainability as which environmental, economic, and social as relevance also. And I think this is, um, uh, it, 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 we need the inclusion of the user community. And that's all the way to far from farmers, all the way to processors and consumers in understanding uh, uh, what, they need, what their needs are so that the research can respond to that. Three points that inform our approach on this. Product life cycles. And this is the idea, again, of having a product profile in mind. And this isn't just for plant breeding, where we're really trying to respond to demand-driven aspects of it. And it helps leverage the whole innovation system, and it helps uh, clarify handoffs within uh, the technology development and adoption cycle. Gender, absolutely critical from our standpoint. Women have different differential perceptions and sources of information. Uh, and uh, time management, for example, is huge for women. They're not looking for more to do. So productivity and things like, as measured by things like time savings becomes really important. The other thing where gender is critical is in things like mechanization and irrigation. Uh, finally, farmer choice. Uh, this is absolutely essential and we see continuing uh, uh, barriers to farmer access and farmer choice. And this is true with both technologies, but also information and digital approaches. And so things like broadband, as well as evidence and science-based regulatory systems are, are really critical to give farmers those choices. And uh, so this inclusion uh, in, in both policymaking as well as in technology development is the heart of our uh, 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 work. And I think this will be important as we look forward to future scientific advances, whether they be genetic, uh, digital, or, or other types of, of uh, te technologies, for example, reduction of tariffs and things like that on irrigation pumps and other critical inputs. So I'll stop there. And I think now I pass it to uh, Usha Barwale Zair. Thank you, Rob. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, the critical role of R&D cannot be emphasized enough as R&D combined with political will is what saw India get out of the severe food challenge it faced in the 60s and 70s. Indian agriculture is all about smallholder farmers and the private sector in India is also focused on delivering um, improved genetics, improved products for the smallholder farmer group. The smallholder farmers also are well positioned to actually be the solution in our climate change story. And I will talk briefly about that as I continue. Continued efforts by the public and private sector have brought us where we are today in India, self-sufficiency, uh, significant exports. But despite that, uh, our challenges, of course, continue and we are all aware of it. But the research investment in agriculture in India is also far below what is needed. The most upfront areas of research, uh, Rob highlighted a couple of them in terms of plant breeding, of course, uh, continue to need uh, investments so that we are ready with new materials which will which will stand with the with the environmental changes that we see. But today I want to talk about two other areas where we have not seen significant investments in research and they have direct correlation with resilience and sustainability. So new transformation, expanding the scope in terms of research activities, old but also new. So the first one I want to talk about are biological treatments uh, in agriculture. These of course have been around for a long time but more recent efforts, research efforts, have highlighted how we can combine different combinations and bring about productivity gains uh, or maintain productivity and at the same time improve soil health, reduce greenhouse gases. 
The second uh, point that I would like to talk about is uh, really not talked about from the smallholder perspective. In the Indian context, productivity is not the only important aspect from, a, from the farmer perspective. Profitability of the farmer has become much more critical and the research focus for us is also around how to make the smallholder farmer more profitable. The smallholder farmers today do not participate in the emerging carbon markets, for instance, and uh, research efforts in remote sensing, in regenerative ag practices, and scalable monitoring solutions will allow the farmers, the smallholder farmers, to generate carbon credits, either as soil organic carbon or carbon dioxide equivalents, which can be traded, and farmers not into supporting the productivity which is required uh, and also address the environmental issues and receive additional income. The fastest way to get this done is by partnership. Partnerships with government is extremely important. In the area of remote sensing, for instance, uh, policies of the government, which uh, the data which is already available in terms of a satellite image, but location-specific information which the governments have, the public institutes which work in a number of these regenerative agriculture space and the private sector. So investment in research and development in traditional, uh, I come from a seed background, so talking about plant breeding is much more uh, up my stream than, than talking about the biological solutions or the climate resilience. Uh, aspect, but I think the new areas of opportunity uh, will make the agriculture of the smallholder farmers the solution that is scalable, that is cost effective and fast in reaching our sustainability goals. And this can only happen with a political will in the policy environment, which is appropriate to get this done. Thank you. And I will hand it off to uh, Vandele Silobo. Thank you so very much, uh, Usha, for, 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 the, for those points. I think for me, uh, really reflecting um, on, on a couple of stuff that came up initially from Tom's presentation, as well as uh, from Madhu's presentation, there's about three points, for example, that Tom requests that we, we will reflect on. Firstly, on the story of investments in R&D in the African continent. And I think that you've, you both, uh, Tom, you've captured that uh, with that productivity story. And also even on your recent writing, um, uh, th th that point has come up more clearly um, or onto that. But maybe what I would add, uh, Tom, in there, particularly from a private sector perspective now sitting in South Africa, what we typically look at when we're thinking about expanding and going into other countries, and obviously when we are investing in those countries, we add into productivity, either we will be uh, investing more on the value chain or whatever part of the agricultural or the food system. But the key basic things that I think many African countries needs to get right is investments really in the network industries. And those are some of the points that Madhu's point was speaking about around uh, the market uh, related uh, uh, infrastructure that, that, that is needed. Either it's the roads, dams and stuff like that. I think those are the fundamentals that at least on a public expenditure, a number of countries needs to, to, to actually have those in, in place. And obviously the other thing that we tend to care about, which I think the governments also have control over this, is the story of around about the land governance. Those are the important things for private sector to come in into those sectors. You really need to have a, a stronger view and a, and a, and a, and a stronger um, and, and clear direction on a land governance uh, perspective. And obviously, I think the, the other issues are generally around ensuring that uh, when private sector players are coming in in various countries in the continent, our investments will be nicely protected. The rule of law is strong and stuff. Those are the basics that I think we, we, we require. But I think from a public perspective then, uh, Tom, you, you, you kind of referred uh, to, to, to some of those points on, on a government side. The misalignment, for example, that you referred to, 
between the returns on investments as well as what the political parties or the governments will be needing a quick wins within the five years that they are still in, in, in government. Now we need to then to say, how do you change then that dynamic or that view amongst the, 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 the African governments to say, yes, the returns will be 30 years. You are only in government for five years, but please do this for the future. How do you get in the minds of politicians to pretty much see that? And I think that's an important, more maybe philosophical or uh, question that we really need to, to struggle with. And on your second point um, that, that Tom, you, you were also raising there was to say, how do we mobilize the political commitment uh, to really investments into agriculture? And one of the things there that I think maybe we, we need to begin thinking about is that for long period, we talk about agriculture largely to say it needs to contribute uh, to food security, uh, poverty in the smallholder farming and all of those things, which is all good and well and very important. But I do think that we need to emphasize some bit of a paradigm shift of actually making sure that as Africans, uh, we see agriculture as one of the important economic sectors where we can say governments, you need to actually invest heavily here. These are the major economic returns that you can pretty much yield rather than only seeing it as a livelihood business, but it is an important sector of the economy, just like mining or any other sector of the economy. And I think that then once there is that paradigm shift in the thinking, maybe the level of commitment and investments that could come through, um, uh, 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 we could begin to see some changes in there. And obviously when we take on that uh, view of the question, or, 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 of, of the statement, we have then to articulate even the gains that are along the value chains of the food sector or agriculture at large, those employment gains and everything else that would come along that. And I think that we need to be to be much more strongly on to that point. And perhaps the other thing before I move to my last point, I would add there, Tom, is that one of the, of the, of the issues, I mean, Kevin alluded there to the point in his remarks, so he was saying, we need to see research and good work done by Africans for, 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 for Africa. And I think that some of the uh, research money that comes into agriculture usually comes through the donor funding and prefers largely the international institutions. Now we need to think about to say, how do, do we tap in on the international skills to make sure that there is a proper collaborations with the local institutions across the African countries so that whatever work and research that gets to be done in the long run that is carried out um, by the local by the local institution and the closing point as my time is running out is really on the last point Tom where we say how do we guard against uh, certain parties weaponizing science and I think that for me, uh, at least in my perspective, we've seen it with the genetically modified crops. I mean, your own essay, for example, in Science Magazine in, 2000, in June 2021 speaks to the gains that we could get by improved seed breeding. But we've seen in Africa, for example, genetically modified crops being uh, really something that many countries don't want to touch except South Africa. But if you were to look closely into that, it largely comes with some of the NGOs that would push that view. But in a number of countries in the US, South America, we've seen the gains are coming into that. Now, we need to guard against some of those things whereby certain science and certain innovations uh, can be weaponized and viewed in certain ways while there is research that does show that there are gains that could be that could be uh, we could get into that and i think that's some of the things that we need to think about let me stop there thank you thank you very much um wow honor to be the the last remark um so first of all thanks for the invitation i'm really honored to be included as part of this panel and grateful for the invitation to contribute to the discussion with information drawn from our experience at Bayer. My work entails development of engagement policies and partnerships to advance our sustainability commitments and new business models that create shared value with new and existing stakeholders. So I am even more thrilled to be here among such distinguished panelists. Um, being a Brazilian uh, and a member of the Bayer Global Leadership Team, I feel I understand the unique challenges that food system in the Southern Hemisphere face. It's my personal and professional experience that knowledge sharing and horizontal cooperation, for example, has played a critical role in partner government and organization efforts 
to improve food system resilience and food insecurity reduction. So today I want to open with a few comments on the critical role of agricultural research and development in achieving resilient and sustainable food system in sub-Sahara -Sub Africa as the focus of our discussion. Some of those were already addressed on previous interventions. Um, first, of course, vulnerabilities and tensions in our world's food system affect the entire food supply chain and present opportunities to strengthen its resilience. Cultivating a food system that can withstand these stressors requires innovative transformation that can be, be implemented with speed and at scale. COVID has given us some interesting examples. Um, agricultural research and development has to put farmer-focused solutions at the forefront with the goal of empowering farmers to engage in capacity building practices, knowledge sharing that was uh, mentioned by some of the panelists, and sustainable farming practices. Economic resilience and sustainable food system also uplift the surrounding communities. We have been learning with some of the projects we have, particularly in Asia which is imperative, of course, given the UN estimates that there will be 334 million young people in Africa by 2030. And there is a critical role of data and technology to drive resilience going forward. A transformative change to better economic and in field management practices, for example. So development of digital solution and infrastructure is an imperative for sustainable food systems. Of course, we acknowledge challenges and barriers facing sustainable food systems in Africa. For example, supporting farmer profitability while also promoting environmental sustainable farming business. There is need to optimize input use, minimize impact to natural resources while maximizing productivity and profitability. There are a few fundamental questions that we need to collectively address, such as how can farmers become competitive in local and international markets? We need to accelerate actions for equitable income opportunities for all farmers, regardless of gender, geography, culture, age, or acreage. We know that in rural areas, opportunities for youth joining the workforce are often limited to family agriculture, resulting in even higher rates of vulnerable employment than urban areas. Crop protection, crop disease, natural disasters, on-farm challenges. Those are threats to the health and livelihood of all those who directly and indirect rely on infected crops. Instability related to food security. We need to better understand as well dietary shifts um, in, every, in Africa and that beyond the farm uh, value opportunities. But I believe that private sector are in the functions as a critical component of the partnership efforts to achieving a more resilient and sustainable food system. For example, the cutting edge research, innovation and resources from within the private sector in collaboration with the public sector farmers, the, private, the, the scientific institutions, NGOs, governments, Advance in R&D that allow for initiatives that directly address urgent and immediate needs of farmers for crop adaptation and resilience, for example. There is the capability to leverage private sector R&D resources and expertise to a worldwide presence through partnerships across sector and through the food chain. And as I mentioned, is the utmost priority the development of scalable digital agriculture tools and connectivity that makes it easier for agronomic information to be delivered directly to farmers, regardless of size, and for farmers to be connected to markets. So my time is up. I will close just with two points. So overall, I believe in the co-creation of programs that increase farmer productivity, crop protection, connect them to new market access points that drive new income generating opportunities, like the carbon markets that was mentioned by Usha. And most especially, I want to close my remarks sharing that I believe that with the increasing role of environmental, social and government governance, ESG criteria in private sector companies operations and increased public interest in socially conscious investments, the opportunity for alignment between public and private sector priorities has never been greater. So one of the questions that was posed to us at the beginning. So I'll be happy to engage during the Q&A and I believe I hand back to Richard. Thank you very much. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. I mean, this is a very exciting uh, conversation. I, I wish uh, we also had more government officials here. Uh, and indeed, I mean, those who work in the CG systems as well. Uh, there are quite a number of questions which are, are coming up, uh, which speak to, you know, the need for deepening uh, that connection between uh, CG uh, systems and uh, NARS, um, as well as uh, indeed deepening engagement with uh, government uh, uh, officials. Um, we'll now move on to a question and answer. There, there are quite a few questions that are, are, are coming up, um, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, we'll be open to receive uh, responses from uh, any one of you. Um, let me start off from with uh, one of the nagging questions that continue to recur across Africa. How can countries like Malawi, which have over 80% of subsistence farmers that rely on government subsidies year in and year out, change policy direction to improve productivity and move these farmers out of dependency syndrome. Uh, billions have been spent on subsidies. I think that's a question. Um, how, how do we really sustain, build a resilience among these farmers who continue to depend on our, our subsidies, uh, particular input subsidies from government? Um, I, I know Tom, maybe uh, you might want to answer that question. Uh, you're, that's one of the, the, the issues you've been raising for many, many years. Uh, right. Tom, would you want to have a crack at that one? Yeah, Richard, thanks. So I'll just take uh, 30 seconds. Um, what about the idea of uh, matching funds to give African governments the incentive to invest in agricultural R&D? I really appreciate Lulama having dug into those figures and shown that um, most African governments spend less than 1% of ag GDP on research. Uh, would they have more incentive to, to invest in their own agricultural R&D systems if uh, the World Bank or the African Development Bank were to have some kind of matching grant program to uh, incentivize them. Just putting that out on the table. Thank you. Well, th 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 thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I think connected to, to that is uh, a question that is directed uh, to African uh, Development Bank, uh, and Kevin, perhaps you might want to respond to that. Um, you know, as Senior Director at the African Development Institute, can you comment on what the bank is doing to develop capacities of national level African uh, research and development institutions to generate the knowledge we need to improve agriculture productivity in Africa? Um, I, I think this is linked to a, a related question which arose to say, how best can you, as a bank, use African policy analysts uh, to um, engage better their national governments? Uh, Kevin? Kevin? Um, maybe we can move on to uh, another question. Uh, this, this one, again, maybe relates to uh, some the earlier discussions which are uh, uh, I believe Rob raised uh, about political economy, again, looking at the policy research. Uh, and I think this question uh, being asked is around how we bring mass media closer to the, these conversations for purposes of taking these messages to the people we want to impact. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, sensitive, you know, uh, issues which usually are raised uh, in uh, these conversations, in terms of government commitment and wasted resources, governance issues, uh, how can we use the media better to really reach out to, uh, with both, you know, research messages, but also even to governments? Uh, anyone can uh, respond to that uh, question? Well, I think 
the key issue here that Wisdom's uh, question uh, raises is the, the issue of information and how do you raise awareness? Uh, you know, information is so critical and we see it as a larger and larger component of ag transformation as people, uh, people have mentioned things like diversification and such. All of that implies greater access to information, whether it be through media channels or potentially through uh, extension channels in the public or private sector. So, uh, but I, I don't, I think we've seen really effective uh, uh, Shamba Shape Up type use of the media. And I, I'm really glad that this is highlighted because I think this idea of, you know, open, act, open media, broadband, uh, less unfettered markets, uh, uh, all of these uh, mean more opportunities and are more democratizing, I think, particularly for smallholder farmers. Although I think we do need to think very intentionally about ensuring that those messages do reach the end users. Fortunately, we're making progress on that front as well. Well, thank you, Rob. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a, a very important uh, uh, area we need to, to, to speak to, uh, use of media better. Um, there is, uh, I think in these conversations, the question of inclusivity was raised about how best we reach out to women as well as uh, youth. Uh, there's this question, uh, would you speak to the implications for focus on uh, inclusive economic growth driven by increased productivity to increase, to create diverse jobs that are better and more profitable for young people, including young women, as well as the uh, food systems, as Usha pointed out. Usha, would you like to uh, respond to that? Thank you, Richard. Uh... I think uh, in the Indian context, if we look at the number of women who are engaged in agriculture, uh, the numbers are huge. But the big challenge that we have is that uh, the women normally don't have land rights. Uh, they actually don't have access to information and also very, very limited transport. So as a result, the women don't play as much of a role in the decision making which they should be playing. And I think uh, the bigger challenge is uh, to empower these uh, women engaged in agriculture because they're already engaged. So it's not that they are not working, but they are not empowered for the decision-making roles that they should be playing. No, th 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 thank, you, thank you, thank you for that, yeah. Um, there's also a question which uh, has been raised about NARS scientists. Uh, they often complain that uh, they are being regarded as junior partners to CGIAR scientists, leading sometimes to less access to research resources, even when the project proposals are developed jointly. Uh, this question of uh, bringing on board NARS and uh, allowing NARS to work very closely uh, with uh, local uh, with the CGR uh, scientists uh, keeps on being raised. I, I believe, Tom, you, you responded, I think, in part to that one, um, unless maybe somebody else would like to comment on that one. Um, how best do we ensure that, uh, you know, CGIAR scientists do not see themselves as superior to uh, the NARS and how can they best work together? I think that's a question. Um, it's an important question. Anybody would like to uh, make some additions to that? Well, Richard, I wanted to give other people a chance, but I, I would like to say something about that. <clears throat> Maybe others will uh, chime in after me. Um, I, yeah, Tom. In discussions yeah. with um, foundations and um, bilateral uh, development organizations, I often hear the uh, people say, well, we don't want to touch uh, national R&D. It's just too thorny. It's too intractable. Uh, and people have been saying that for three decades now. And the, the, it just more, you know, all of the efforts to improve livelihoods across the boards for, for women and for youth and for, 
you know, social protection, al almost everything having to do with rural development is now being constrained by the lack of progress in tackling uh, adaptive national level R&D. Uh, so we're, we're, you know, how can we expect youth and women to invest their time and their resources in a sector where productivity is not rising over time. It's really a losing proposition. And as other people in the chat I've noticed have uh, stressed the role of profitability, it's profitability in the sector that will drive, uh, you know, entry, youth, youth attracting to, to agriculture, women being able to make uh, agricultural attractive. So it's productivity growth that is a necessary, not so, it's not a sufficient condition, but it's certainly a necessary condition uh, to get that right. And um, as, as I think is well known, the CG system is just, they just don't have the reach to be able to get to on the ground uh, impact uh, in the varied conditions that millions of smallholders uh, in Africa face with all the varied conditions that they have. And that's why adaptive national level R&D is really a crucial segment of that, of that chain. Uh, so I think sooner or later, we're going to need to tackle the adaptive R&D issue and capacitate that sector, give it the resources it needs, and really have that make that uh, a key focus of efforts to promote productivity. Thank you. Yep. And maybe if I just jump in after Tom on, on this issue, there are two sides to that question. And it's not just in adaptive R&D in agriculture only, it's actually about R&D investments in Africa in general. So Tom has very clearly raised the issues about <clears throat> the difference focus in focus of the, of the, of the research. They are complementary instead of competitive. They are not substitutive uh, in my view. And the, the adaptive, investing in adaptive R&D at national levels should actually be questions for national governments to, to handle. So um, when the nature of the structure of funding that we have, we've done some research in, in this, uh, the ADI, to try and understand why is this not really happening across board? Um, why is Afri are African governments not investing enough? And why are donors also not investing enough? Um, in research and development in Africa. And so many things come up. One is absorptive capacity. Money goes to where there is transparency, where there is accountability, and the managerial skills to deploy the resources to achieve impact. So, uh, I mean, we, we have to be factual that some of our institutions need a lot of capacity, um, re institutional capacity reinforcement. So, Improving productivity is one aspect. Creating markets is another aspect. But then the other aspect is actually the absorptive capacity of these institutions themselves to receive these resources and deploy them uh, effectively. And that is why at the African Development Institute, we are doing two things. One, to invest, uh, trying to mobilize to invest in institutional capacity development across the continent. And then secondly, to establish a knowledge and capacity development trust fund for Africa, where we can then be able to um, support African institutions at, um, in more generally for research and development, of course, agriculture being the mainstay of African economy. That's also at the center of what we're trying to do. But as African researchers as, um, and as African governments, I think we need to think about what we can do uh, much more than what donors should do for us. The donors are doing their best. The international development partners are doing their best, resolving their own problems in their national uh, needs, which there are needs there as well, and trying to help us. So how do we meet them halfway in order to make sure that we will be able to uh, own the process, define the agenda, and be able to do research that complements what they are doing for us and what they are funding for us. For me, I think that's the way forward. Yeah, no, thank you, Kevin. I, I think you're responding to an earlier question on uh, what the bank is doing to develop capacities of national level African R&D institutions. Uh, but I, I think turning around the same question, 
uh, Rob had raised the question of also looking at how we strengthen policy research institutes and also addressing some of these uh, political economy related issues, which also include uh, addressing issues of governance and uh, abuse of resources, uh, subsidies which are abused, particularly for smallholder farmers. Um, okay. I'm wondering whether you know the bank is uh, looking at also these uh, strengthening local policy research institutes. Okay. Um, sorry, I had I had stepped out briefly uh, to another meeting, another virtual meeting. So uh, the 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 point here is we've come to recognize that the bank has done quite a lot of good work. I hope everybody agrees on mobilizing in mobilizing resources for hard infrastructure investments in Africa, building roads, airports, and so on. But we need to do a lot more in mobilizing resources and investing in knowledge and institutional capacity development, without which the roads will not function. Uh, if you put to get, most roads are actually uh, build, operate, and transfer. If you do build, operate, and transfer, where there are no, no strong institutions, governance systems, uh, it won't work. So we need to, uh, so that's the reason for the African Development Institute that is now being reprioritized by the president of the African Development Bank and the board of the African Development Bank that we try to strengthen institutional capacity of Africa-led institutions. So Tom, uh, Thomas Jane and many others are working with us on that to try and learn from their experiences on how they've done it in the US, how they are doing it in Africa, and so on and so forth, and what we can do in order to move that agenda forward. So then the second point is what I have mentioned in terms of the tool to do that is to have a multi-donor trust fund for institutional capacity strengthening and knowledge management in Africa. And that will help us to address one bottleneck that most donors and development partners were talking about, i.e. absorptive capacity, the managerial capacity, and so on. So my argument to them is, okay, the bank is a triple A institution, uh, actually rated this year as the best MDB in the world and so on. So we don't have an excuse as a donor to say, we don't find institutions in Africa to give the money. So let's do the same uh, we do in hard infrastructure. Uh, the bank is being entrusted with 200 and, 200 and something, 208 billion or so. Um, the, the current recap recapitalization of the bank for hard infrastructure. Let's do the same in soft infrastructure, which is knowledge, science and technology, intellectual property, and so on, because that's actually 50% of most economies. Um, so we're still investing in uh, the other 50%. So basically we're doing quite a lot on that. And there was a question that you raised about youths. The African Development Bank is actually investing heavily on youth entrepreneurship in agriculture. We call the agri agripreneur program. Um, and I hope my colleagues from the agriculture complex join the meeting as well. Um, and quite a lot of work is being done on technology innovation, agricultural technology transfer programs, the TAT program, and also the AFAWA program, which is the uh, making finance work for African women. So there are a lot of initiatives that the president of the bank has brought to the bank and we are working on. And uh, we rely on all the skills and experiences of everyone around the table to make them work. Thank you. No, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Um, one more question before I, I pass on to uh, Louise to make uh, closing remarks. Um, Natasha, perhaps you might want to respond to this question. How do you respond to those who would argue that uh, the entire research and as well as uh, development system as well as extension is geared towards uh, uh, serving the interests of global corporate interests rather than the interests of smallholder farmers, particularly in Africa. Uh, we know that you spoke about your work with youth uh, and um, how, you know, does that speak to, um, you know, mm -hmm. serving, you know, the, the, the wider interests of um, maybe smallholder farmers as well. Yeah, no, great. glad to, to answer that one. And, and just quickly, I saw there was a, a question around youth. We, we have been accelerating as well our work with youth. Uh, we we um, have been 
um, re reshaping our platform, we realized that our open innovation uh, platform was focused on what we would call more mature sciences. And now we are advancing that platform to look at use, use needs, um, use are in needs of specific tools. You know, agriculture is not attractive anymore. Um, they need particularly getting in touch with networks and mentoring. So those are the kind of things that we are looking at from a global point of view, but then as well looking at regions um, and specific conditions because there's specific type of farming and needs uh, if you look at Africa, uh, Latin America, or if you look, look at the cropping systems um, that those use um, are part of. But happy to, to share more um, offline uh, to who asked me that question in more details of our platform. And then um, on, on the serving the interests, um, I was reading this question. So I think we are in the interest of uh, serving and solving farmers uh, challenges. Um, we, we have been um, focusing, I think when we think about public and, 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 and private opportunities, I think we have been focusing on improving food system sustainability, improving uh, food security, and now more than ever, thinking about, I think it was Usha, or I don't recall who of the panelists mentioned, but thinking about what are the beyond the farm opportunities for farmers, meaning how can we start rewarding farmers, not only on, on what they produce, but as well how they produce, if you think about sustainability. So um, I think it's, it's a matter of uh, transparency, it's a matter of uh, building partnership in a transparent environment where we have an outcome focus for our research. Today at Bayer, I can tell for sure that um, our focus is of course addressing on farm challenges of farmers, thinking about low cost tools that we can provide, how they can access those tools as well. And then what are the challenges beyond the farm and the opportunities that, can, that, can, they, they, that we can help them um, uh, find. And with that, uh, the answer is not only Bayer, not only our uh, pipeline, the answer is partnership and thinking about ecosystem of solutions. Yesterday, our CEO just announced it, for example, together with Rabobank, a digital platform for Southeast Asia, which we are partnering, partnering with the Singapore uh, government there. And that digital platform where we can get access of tools and access of information to farmers faster. So we couldn't, we couldn't create, create this platform in a way that we would bring a solution tailored for farmers in Vietnam and Philippines in this case, if we haven't, uh, if we didn't partner with governments and with um, another piece of the value chain. So I think um, trust, transparency and ecosystem solutions so we can solve um, the challenges that the farmers have. Well, thank you very much, Natasha. Uh, exciting stuff. Um, this is a, a great conversation. Uh, I, I wish we could go on and on and on. Uh, but we're very keen, at least from the Africa side, that uh, you know this coalition of uh, uh, the willing coalition of partners should continue with these uh, conversations. At this stage, uh, let me introduce uh, to you uh, Louise Fox, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the African Growth Institute, Brookings Institute. Uh, Louise is also a, a great friend of youth, a, a great friend of uh, women, farmers, <laughs> a great friend of uh, development in Africa. And uh, she will give us uh, you know, her wrap up remarks. Uh, Louise. Thank you very much, Richard. And I must say, it's such a pleasure um, to engage with this group today. Um, I thought the comments were uh, the presentations of the panels were all on target, fascinating, and reflected different aspects of the ecosystem of uh, uh, research and development in, in Africa, as well as uh, many of the questions were quite uh, perceptive and thoughtful. So it is a challenge to summarize, but let me do my best. Let's remind us where we started. Uh, we started with Tom and Madur talking about really what's at stake for Africa in terms of why science is so important. Africa being the poorest continent and three quarters of the low income countries in the whole world are found in Africa. Uh, and of course, a lot of African poverty is rural. And so uh, raising the incomes and the welfare of smallholder farmers is critical for African development. and. Uh, and productivity-led growth is what's needed. So 
the most of the discussion talked about how to close the gap between what African agriculture could be and what it is today and the role of science. And I think um, there was a wide agreement that we need uh, local public R&D um, that meets the needs of smallholder farmers, otherwise it won't be adopted. Um, just to summarize very quickly what the panelists talked about, I think Kevin focused on the role of policies and what clear goals around policies, and he suggested what those goals ought to be. And also he focused on the role of the African Development Bank in supporting governments to adopt those policies. Lulama talked about local um, innovation, as did Rob, and Rob had some clear messages for donors around local investment. Usha talked about the public-private efforts in India and how the rest of the world can learn from that. Uh, Wandali talked about Africa making its own policies, using Western expertise to develop African expertise, but the Africa making the decisions and its own policies. Natasha, from the private sector point of view, talked a lot about inclusion, which everyone else highlighted as well, but sometimes it's important when it comes from the private sector. And I think most of the discussion, the questions really talked about the how. Everyone agrees we need to strengthen national agriculture R&D in Africa, but how? And I think one thing that I'd like to close with was there was the importance of donors treating um, national R&D systems in Africa and national governments in Africa as equals. African equals. So I think I'd like to close on that point because it's uh, so important uh, for everyone in the donor community uh, to remember. Um, and so thank you everyone for joining us. I think it was a fantastic discussion. Uh, I certainly gained a lot and I hope you did too. Thank you very much.